writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. I am David Allen Lucas, your host for Right Pack Radio. I am an author of science fiction, mystery, horror, and poetry. With me today is... Fedora Amos. I write Victorian whodunits. I have out a book now, Jack the Ripper in St. Louis. It takes you back to 1897 St. Louis, a place where the real Jack the Ripper may have died in 1903. I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I write uh, YA fantasy. And I illustrate children's books and anything else. I'm Matt McGraw. Uh, I'm an amateur prose writer mostly, although I uh, did some screenwriting in college. Currently, I'm working on a book with uh, Jennifer here called Patrick the Spider, a picture book. I'm Jamie Kickover. I write middle grade and young adult science fiction and fantasy. And yes, I really am a rocket scientist. I'm Brad Cook, uh, author, publisher of Blank Slate Press and president of St. Louis Writers Guild. I'm Melanie Colaney. I write uh, science fiction and fantasy, and for some reason I just started a cookbook. <laughs> and uh, I also have a day job uh, working as a research scientist. Hi, I'm Kathleen Kayembe. I write under a pen name, LGBT fiction, and paranormal romance, and urban fantasy, and I think magic is the coolest thing ever. And speaking of magic, today's topic is the muse. Yes, that insane thing that seems to drive us, all of us writers, completely off the edge. It has known to drive some writers to drink. Other ones, we just go straight to the page and start writing. I don't know about anybody else here at the Right Pack, but I know when I get approached, hey, where do you get your ideas from? My real response, though I don't say it, is I have no clue where a lot of these things come from. In ancient days, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans believed that the muse was actually an entity or a deity onto itself that talked to the artist. And what over the centuries that has changed. Where do you get your muses from? Oh, um, I was going to say with relation to the Greeks and Romans, Elizabeth Gilbert has a TED talk about creativity that will tell you more about the things that you just outlined. Excellent. Well, you know, Dave, <laughs> when you said the word muse, I said to myself, I don't have a muse. Everything comes from the old bean right up here. But then, you know, I thought about it, and something told me, yeah, maybe you do have a muse somewhere. And where is it? And how do I know that I had one? It's because of writing Jack the Ripper in St. Louis. It's set in a newspaper office, so of course there had to be a chief editor. And I had absolutely no trouble finding the name for this chief editor. Because, you know, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have categories of names. And I try to find one that matches, that matches in meaning and sound. And I have a lot of trouble with that. It can take me days to think of a name. But this one came to me just like that. And it's Suetonius Ham. <laughs> <laughs> that came well, to you like it that? It did. Wow. Just like that. Suetonius but, you know, even though I had two years of high school Latin, I had no idea who Suetonius was, so I had to look him up. And it turns out that he was absolutely perfect. He was a librarian. He was a writer. He wrote books about children's games and pop culture in ancient Rome. And he wrote books about famous whores. Now, let me tell you, it doesn't get much better than that. And so that's why my muse is Suetonius. And it's the perfect symbolism in your story concerning Jack the Ripper went around killing whores. Oh, you're so right. <laughs> so have you looked him up, and do you have a library of Suetonius works now? Well, now, if you want me to go into the lives of the famous Caesars, which is, by the way, how we know about the Caesars, because he wrote everything down mm -hmm. for 14 Caesars, but he also wrote about poets, and he wrote about grammarians and speakers, and he was just an all-around great guy. But it would take me many volumes to tell you anything about, uh, say, uh, Julius, Augustus, Titus, Nero, and Caligula. I could go on for hours about just those two. 
They were kind of crazy. Oh, <laughs> kind of crazy? Kind of oh my god! Are we all kind of crazy? Yeah, we listen are. to the voices in our head. We don't burn down cities and play violins, though. We just write about all the people burning in the cities. I you burned down do cities that? before. <laughs> well, no, no, no. The, the was violin say, was not in invented. Not the violin, yeah. but like he it was, was playing, a liar. There we go. And Antonius was the one who wrote down that it was a liar. He's, He's officially no. my favorite person <laughs> ever right now. And just oh, while well, we're talking about Switchonius, before we get back to the muse, I don't know if anyone has ever read Robert Graves. Um, um, I Claudius and Claudius the God, no. but a lot based of, on oh, Suetonius. Yes. Okay. Suetonius is still a super rad name. It, <laughs> it is. is. I love it. Super. Super rad. Uh, hey, do I get a turn? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> are we going around? All right. Where are we? Uh, what? You're just gonna take it out of my hand? It's, I didn't think it. Well, just go. go <laughs> yeah, okay. Fine. <laughs> All right, well, my muse, my I tend to craft my own muses when I'm writing a story. I I usually start with the ending. Like, I, I paint a scene, and in that scene, I think about who's in there and how they're acting, and the rest of the book is kind of written to make that scene, like, powerful. So, like, my main character is often my muse, because I want to make sure that her, his or her conclusion is going to be, like, a punch. Or in my current novel, the supporting character is a muse because he is my lead character's motivation. So they come to life inside me, and they drive me to continue. It's interesting Do you have any trouble you... with the names? I don't have trouble with the names, no. They're all puns. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> I know who to come to since you find <laughs> these gems of names. You, you try, you, you do the exact opposite. You know, you start with the ending scene. My problem with a lot of my stories is that I kind of write this fiction mm -hmm. like it's a history so the idea is develop their entire lives and then tell a portion of it but their lives go on mm -hmm. and even if the main character dies there are other people around so i just continue on with the story of their lives so there's not really a definite ending mm -hmm. all right well i'm killing all the things <laughs> and not on paper um on that note um it sounds like we're getting into writing strategies and the our process and I wanted to know if you guys are separating the muse from inspiration because for me often something will inspire me to start writing but it won't necessarily be what keeps me writing later it might be cut out entirely well let me throw right in there so thank you you actually gave me a perfect segue to describe how my muse works and the way the reason I did that is my muse I figured out the only the other day how this thing actually worked. And the only way to really explain it, I always thought, eh, maybe I'm just a little, I'm always trying to be too precise with what I'm doing and so forth. No, I've actually got two aspects. And if you've ever seen the movie, What About Bob? You will understand how my muse works. And if you have not seen it, 1989, go look it up. Richard Dreyfuss and Bill, Bill Murray. Bill Murray is a character who has every psychosis possible. And Richard Dreyfuss is a psychologist who's going to be interviewed by um, Good Morning America, and he's very precise. He's got everything in order, clean house type thing. Well, the clean house type thing is me, and my muse turns out to be Bill Murray, <laughs> who just jumps in there, starts wearing the guy's pajamas, sleeping, not sexually, but sleeping with the family. He gives it, he invites himself. <laughs> and we went not and sexually. We weren't going to do that before. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't, yeah. Bob doesn't see people like that. Yeah, Bob doesn't see people like that. He keeps his pajamas on. <laughs> yeah, he keeps his pajamas on. And Bill, uh, sorry, Richard drives this character, literally ties him up, puts, if I remember right, gasoline, I think maybe even dynamite around him, to knock the character off, and the character, the the explosion does not happen. I'm I'm sorry. Spoiler, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Jeez. But Bill common. Murray believes that he's been cured of all his psychosis by death therapy. This is the way my muse and I work. Complete insanity. Yeah, I would I would say that too. But in response to Kathleen's question, um, it all kind of comes at me like a Mack truck all at once. Because I write a lot of science fiction, I am constantly asking what if, what if, what if, and I'll just see something and then all of a sudden I'll go, well, what if this? And then the next thing I know, there's all these characters coming at me in my head and, you know, it doesn't matter where I am, all of a sudden I'm writing something and it just takes over my body and it's like I got struck by an arrow. So <laughs> that's why I named my muse Orion. Cause you named you, your muse? I named oh, my wow. muse. His name is Orion. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little pain in the butt sometimes. Okay. Um, is the galaxy on his belt? 
<laughs> he does. Well, and I had to go to science fiction, and I mean, constellations, yeah. you know, you can't get more science than that. So She is a rocket scientist. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So he shoots me with arrows, and oftentimes at the most inconvenient possible time, like when I'm driving, <laughs> when I'm in the shower, any place you can't have a pencil or a computer, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I actually you tend to do that. I feel kind of a I feel kind of a kinship with that, although uh, how I think of it isn't quite as pretty. Um, <laughs> I always kind of uh, likened it to like um, vomiting almost. Wow. Like okay. how I look at it is, first I have to go around and I have to eat up like uh, ideas from various areas that aren't necessarily connected. Okay. Yeah. I follow. I follow. You have to. I go around, eat them, and they go down, and they digest for a while, and they sort of turn to a nice little slurry mess together. And then suddenly, you know, I'll just be sitting around with a blank page in front of me, and just... <laughs> well, that's the good, that's the good ones. Uh, the worst is when it's like a dry that's heat the good one. kind of thing. <laughs> you know, where it's like, I'm trying to get it going, and it's just like... <sighs> and it's not going. I so, think that uh, girl's vibe over here, you know, the, the whole word vomit thing. Yeah, no, wait, real vomit. vomit. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be more like uh, the vomit, the vomitorium, I guess, would okay. be the Roman thing. Okay. Okay. Well, oh, I, look at, I see it as like an organic process, and so I try <laughs> not to... Yeah, it's very natural. So should we call libraries vomitoriums now? Because that's kind of what I are. Really. I think we want more kids is to read. Is that why Alexandria or, burned down? Is no, that why that call, library went... I think it's more accurate to say that they? school is a vomitorium. Because that's where the writing happens I mostly. Say, I don't know that Because, you know, burns, it's more like the sure. library would be just a bucket of other people's vomit. Yes. There's no actual vomiting going on in the library. It's just where you store everybody else's. <laughs> so it's more like a... Oh, what is it? It's a like toilet. a septic tank. <laughs> Well, so, here, so here's my question with that. Schools have now been told, been classified as killing creativity. Yes. Mostly because they're te doing tests that are being required by some MBA who's translated some law into some way. And it makes absolutely no sense. So the kids are vomiting back, really, what they're being tested on. Mm. So no, that's really the problem. They're vomiting other getting. people's vomit. They exactly. just get the vomit right in, and then it goes I'm right back out. I'm going to be ill. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's get back to the muse. <laughs> Sorry, I did that. So uh, you, Matt, had said uh, hmm? vomiting. I have heard it um, explained, I think, by Madeline Lingle as um, stew. And, like, yeah, like, because... No, vomit. it's just the, there's the vomit and stew. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of preparation, so we're not getting right. lunch after this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's much nicer. I, I can't Maybe do food much. references I, right I, now. It's, I it's think not going to work like after a, the vomit like, conversation. Like, because you pick up, you collect, you collect things from all kinds of areas, and you, you, could, you have 50 different things you're doing. Are you building 50 at the same time? You can. If you're a contractor. That's called, you know, putting up condos or something. <laughs> but I, can we do something besides food references? I think it's more like Building a hostile takeover. Like, you know, a hostile takeover. It just, well, like, Brad, what's your muse like? Is your yeah. muse See, like building part. something? My muse has a name too, actually, but it's been the same name and I didn't come up with it. <laughs> so it's actually Eowyn from uh, Lord of the Rings. Aww. And when I was a little kid, that scene where she rips off her helmet and chops off the dragon's head and kills, you know, uh, the, yeah, with the Witch King. Yeah, I mean, he was just uh, the Witch yeah. King, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, so when that happens, and she cries out, you know, that uh, I am no man, for some reason, for a little dude, that totally just blew my mind. <laughs> And ever since then, I've been writing strong women. So, I don't know. It's kind of my we thing. We thank you. Yeah. Yes. yes. You went thank for you. the hot bad. Writing yeah. So, yeah. I and, and ever since, and that's why. So, whenever I write, I don't know, she's somewhere back there, you know, saying I am no, you know. No Thanks man. for being a fan of AON over RON. Okay, yeah. I totally loved AON. <laughs> why do they have to sound so similar? <laughs> Because Tolkien. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Tolkien. What can we because say? everybody does. <laughs> what, what I find interesting is what kind of what Brad was just saying in a way kind of hints and also what Fedora was saying a moment ago a while back at the beginning it's almost like the muse is external to you. They've given themselves names. In your case, Brad, it was a character from a book that's named, that your muse is taking the name of. For Fedora, good choice, but I have no idea how that got taken, but <laughs> it's like a name itself, unlike Jamie, who named her muse herself. But right. so she still sees something separate. outside, though. I had to give him a name because he was being such a punk. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need something to yell when you're mad. You're like, all right! 
<laughs> yeah, I don't really yell at my muse. I don't know. We have, we have a we have an understanding that on Sundays, you know, she gets the day off, and I never write on Sundays. But can, you can know. your muse talk to mine? <laughs> mine doesn't even know what meaning of ne- uh, bedtime muse. Now, now there is no editing muse, so mm. the editor in me will always be like Sundays for editing. No post on Sunday. Well, that's. I think editing is probably more of an analytical process, you know. Mm-hmm. So you can't like. Can't inspiration your way through it. That explains a lot. Yeah, yeah, my inner critic processes. deserves the name before my muse does. That would explain why I really he's like. He's me yeah, I'm pretty sure my inner critic is me. <laughs> <laughs> the critic and the muse have completely different jobs to me um, because one is the muse's entire job is to play and be fearless about you know letting you explore, yes. and the critic is the one that's supposed to be like, okay, that was great. We need to pull back over here and over here, and that's completely irrelevant. Great. This is done. So wait a minute. Do you consider your critic your editor then? Yes. Okay. Because yes. I think an editor might be something different, at least for me. I have a problem. My muse goes away and hides a lot. But um, my editor, unless I just finish something, is usually there to show me what's wrong with something. But that's not necessarily the critic saying this is bad. I mean, part of editing is saying, oh, this would be so much better if it was rearranged and this happened first. And, oh, there's this new scene here that you should add in. <laughs> You know, and that's creative. That's not just... See, critiquing. that's still my critic. Because that's yeah. my critic having a critical eye and looking at everything and mm-hmm. very much mm-hmm. identifying what needs to change and, you know, knowing yeah. that. So that's kind of a process for me. It's not mm-hmm. that the muse cannot say, oh, this would be cool over there instead. Mm-hmm. But Well, somebody has to think of the new paragraph. Yeah. Well, for me, the critic is sometimes that evil voice in my head going to, like, you're not good enough. Yes. This is this sucks. Make it better. But you know the muse is always just there, kind of going, "Do this, do this. This will be cool. Keep going, keep going." And then later you come back and you're like, "Yeah, this sucks." Yes, muses <laughs> yeah. are very encouraging. The muse is the part that's alive, and then the critic's the one that's trying to bring it to the real world. Well, not mine. Okay. <laughs> no, Suetonius, who's been dead for almost two thousand years, is pretty lively sometimes. And if I'm a good girl and I get up in the morning and write like I'm supposed to. Everything goes along pretty well. Is that every if morning I for don't, him? it is every okay. morning, except when I'm a bad girl. And then he kicks me in the slats and says, "What are you doing, you lazy broad?" Okay, on now, that see, note, well, then. to that end, actually, see, I truly believe that that if you show up every day, your muse is going to show up every day. Sure. That was because, what I was going to you know, say. That's can exactly, muse, and that's totally what I believe. Can your muse have a talk with my muse because he does not show up every day, regardless of what I do? I have to, you know, grab him and tie him to a <laughs> chair or something. But see, my to muse do that. Shows up, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, but to do that, you have to be there to grab him and tie him to the chair. So I was wondering what you guys thought about, um, you know, waiting for inspiration to strike versus having a writing habit. Well, and tying my muse to the chair, she let's go back to death, ther- death therapy reference before. Yes. <laughs> but to be honest with you, with the writing discipline, I'm going to be the first one to, to tell you, yes, you've got to have a strong writing discipline. And it's a good idea to have a strong writing schedule. And I'm also the biggest breaker of that. Not that I used to be. I used those who knew me long, long ago. I used to wake up at four o'clock in the morning, write until I had to go to work, write at lunchtime, write when I came home, unless I was actually doing something. But life has taken one hell of a turn for the last almost ten years, and I've I've lost a lot of that discipline I've had been reobtaining it. So discipline is very important. One, my process in writing. If you ever go to my web page. It talks about CYMK, which, by the way, thank you, Jen, for giving me that definition. It's the illustrator. It's the illustrator. What is CYMK? C- okay, CYMK is characters and storyboarding. Then um, Y is the screenplay, Play. which I'm just really doing mostly dialogue and with little, very little description, just enough to tell me what's happening. Then I, then I really work on that for a long time. Then the M is the manuscript, and the K is the final book. And the reason why, and it's, I've been de- developing this for the last almost 10 years, is outside of my writing life, my work and family aspects have really taken over a lot. And sadly, with my work, for example, I could start a novel in January, be working on it really hard for a few weeks, and then I'm not, because of everything I'm juggling, I can't touch it again until maybe September. So I've got nine months to ten months, depending on when that, when in September this happened, or not to October, and I've lost what's going on. 
So I've got to be able to get the idea down real fast, not worry about the description so much. And then that way I can say, okay, I'm able to follow exactly what's happening here. I see what the characters really like, and I can go back and make sure things are really being character-driven and not plot-driven. So I'm, I went from being a pantser to a plotter. And it's been a painful transformation. I have a question. Do uh, the rest of you have ID notebooks? Oh, yeah. Mm. I have an ID file, not necessarily a notebook. Well, yeah. a notebook, whatever. Yeah. It's just a Word document. But. Yeah. <laughs> I have that, and I have uh, draft emails. I have like 92 draft emails right now in my Gmail. That's where, I just, <laughs> that's where I just dump ideas, and then when I, you know, after a while, I dump them into a Word document. I need to remember to do that because I do voice memos in the car because I hear writing while driving is not safe. <laughs> so um, I'll record a voice memo and then email it to myself and I then just leave it and don't pick it back up. Well, Jenna, I know you have like a that journal. Do you write ideas in there? I write everything in there. All the journal is is for catching stuff that doesn't fit in my head anymore. So I write in that. I have a ton. I have just stacks of uh, college ruled notebooks from school that only got filled up a third of the way and now I just I write in it with markers. Just constant stream of consciousness. Plot, thoughts, ideas, characters, lines characters could say, uh, charts on whether or not I should actually turn that man into a woman and vice versa. <laughs> that kind of stuff. So I don't have, it's not like it's a book that's just for ideas, it's whatever is in arm's reach. So I make sure I always have something in arm's reach just in case I need it. And I know somebody who does similar to what you do, Kathleen, except for she actually records entire manuscripts while she's driving. Wow. I couldn't do that. Yeah, I, 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 I've, I've attempted, <laughs> I attempted that. That lasted a good maybe minute. How long it takes for me to get from my driveway down to the first stop oh, sign. And no. if you have really good diction and you need really good diction, I actually can use the software and I don't have good enough diction to that. You can actually plug in your recording to voice recognition software and have it transcribe it for you. And it gets it about 95% right. Yep. How far are you people driving these? <laughs> I, I got a good 20, 30 minute drive to work. I was going to say, if I did this and let the muse take over, I'd be, a, I'd be in a car accident yeah. every yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. No just, yeah. Now to be honest, I actually have a file on my computer that I do, and I do it for like, I'll come up with a nice story idea and I'll just create a file for it and I'll throw a bunch of ideas on it. It may get turned into something, it may not. I have a ton of them sitting on my computer. I also have uh, several notebooks, just kind of like Jen does, and that's mm -hmm. filled with all the ideas from when I was, gosh, 10 years old on up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also have, like, for everything that I do, I have, like, you know, notes jotted down. On, uh, I'm really bad about post-it notes. <laughs> so, and, and then I fold over the sticky part, so then it just turns into this little square piece of paper that can go anywhere. And I have literally a shoebox full of these. <laughs> wow. um, and they just, they have random ideas thrown down on them. It might even be some random fact I heard on TV that would be really good in a book. I need to stick all of mine in like a box. Thank you for boxes that. Boxes help. And then I don't like boxes. Lovely. And then you a can steel. have like no a box are better. Box. Yeah. Then yeah. you can but have like have a random that need to go in boxes. Then when you want to write something new, you can just have a I'm going to pull something random out the of the random hat. story generator. <laughs> I have I will admit to have done doing that for uh, short stories before. That's a good idea. I'm more like Jamie in the sense of I will send emails to myself, and I like the emails because what I do is where I get some of my story ideas is straight out of newspapers, or I should say off of the websites for various news agencies, BBC, whatever, CNN, or some science ones like Red Orbit, and it's like, oh, this would be a good story idea, and, may, and I'll probably look at it later and go, what the hell was I thinking, <laughs> but I'll say, okay, here's some of the use of the story, I'll drop some down in the email, and then I'll start pasting all the different links, and that way I can look at it later. So it's like good though that you have like you feel like it's good to have that distance in between when you have it and then uh, later when you come back to it and look at it again. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's good just to give straight on the page when you're thinking about it, which unfortunately doesn't happen in my life too often. Um, a lot of times though, I like to think of it. I'm tossing in the back of my head like a percolator and laying my. If you've ever seen a percolator work, I mean the old style. Not the modern day coffee pot, but the old style where the water shoots up, goes through the beans, goes back up, goes through the beans, and so Maxwell forth. House. Maxwell House. <laughs> and just let let it keep going and let it keep getting stronger and stronger of a story idea. Yeah, I, I, I feel like a lot of times, uh, uh, the longer I hold on to an idea, the more like stuff grows onto it, and then like it'll become. It's more interesting. It's like it's more complicated. It's got it's better thought out. You know, it just grows over time. But there's also like you have to put it down at some point. You know. No, yeah. you see, you're t putting it down all the way along there, and then you go back. You know, two years later, and you like 
this is what I started with. Okay, this isn't oh, yeah. recognizable to what I have now, but <laughs> I think your I think your subconscious needs time to kind of stew on it, even if you're not actively thinking about it. It's kind of there in the background. Stew. Yes. Yeah, stew. Yeah. Delicious it was, stew. <laughs> I went. There's there. a science fiction. <laughs> I'm not science fiction. There's a mystery thriller writers conference that goes around, and it's also for fans. I call it the Comic Con version for mystery and thrillers, but they don't dress up. Um, it's called BoucherCon. There's no fun in that. Uh, oh, really? Anyway, one of them, it's actually the that's one of the ways I met Fedora a while back, um, and when they had it here in, two thousand, in 2011 in St. Louis, it was an author talking about one of his other authors, and I'm trying to remember who the heck was in the conversation, but they were saying that he always knew when he was working on a novel, because that man would do nothing but watch Jeopardy the entire time. <laughs> he's watching Jeopardy and in the back of his head, while he's not writing physically, in the back of his head the story is going in, on. And he's, getting down, he's getting down the ideas before he sits down and types it. Well, I would say there's very little time that I am not thinking about my stories. That's true. I mean, any idea that I have, it'll be a month before I even start writing. I have to work through everything. I've got to think about all the characters I want to do. I've got to put it all into my head and then I've got to kind of figure it all out. But even for the three months that I write the book or the six to nine months after that that I'm really hardcore editing it, I, I to be honest, I don't think... Uh, I, I think about this, that story uh -huh. constantly, and then as a kind of favor to myself, I'll start thinking about other stuff, and that usually turns into my next book. I don't know if you guys are similar to how I do things, but I have like a million and one ideas, and I would say 90% of them are like one or two lines of, well, what, what if this happened, or... A world where this is the rule. And then I would say like another 8 to 9% of them maybe come to fruition, you know, somewhere between 1 and 10 pages of stuff where it's either characters or actual prose. And then I would say like 1% or less actually becomes something that's worth continuing on to a full novel. So I guess going back to a point you made, David, w earlier was, you know, where do you get your ideas? Well, where do I not get my ideas? I get them from everywhere, but the ma the difference yeah. is most of them don't come to fruition. That's so wait, if someone told you, I have this great idea for a story, you write it and we'll split everything 50-50. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's actually so, happened. Wait, you mean the ideas are not, like, the hard part? The actual <laughs> writing is the hard part? Yeah. You have Absolutely. to work with them? I Kathleen, hate I love your sarcasm. <laughs> I hate the blank page. Like, seriously? I would much rather tear it apart and edit. Like, See, there's, there's like a blank editing. page is filled with possibilities, though. I can do anything on a blank yeah, page. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Well, I like I like at editing it, because thinking. then you can make it better. And I like editing, too, but mm -hmm. there, I, I, it, I've never been afraid of the blank page. There's just too much fun to put down on it. Well, and and somebody, I have to say, too, like you were talking about, mm -hmm. I, I actually, and like you were saying, I like, uh, I find characters first. Mm -hmm. So I generally think of my character, and then I start thinking about what I, the horrible things I want to do to them. <laughs> yeah. Because hmm. when you get to play the evil god. Um, That's something nice it's kind that of I want to do for yeah. them. It's kind of a difference in how you uh, muse, though, is that, like, you're starting with characters, and you mm -hmm. start with, like, a question. Yeah, I start with more mm -hmm. plot, and somehow characters start forming into that world. See, I, I start with the world. It, in fact, that's world building is my favorite part of it. And then I try and think of characters that become more and more real. So real people, if they grew up in this world, what would they be like? And then what would their problems be? And then I have to throw something in. And sometimes the plot comes up real easily, and sometimes it's, okay, I have all these characters, I have this world, what happens to them? The mice you know? quotient. What? There's one we're missing. I don't remember which one it is. Um, Orson Scott Card's book on um, how to write science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. He talks about four different ways that stories get started. And you guys have named three of the four, <laughs> and I'm trying to remember what the last one was. So, excuse me, I'm going to look That's it up. That's because we're awesome. <laughs> That's what Google was invented for. Well, yeah. I don't know that I have the fourth way that Mr. Card would have. However, I have a word that none of you have suggested yet. It is that somehow in my twisted brain, comes into my twisted brain, the black moment. And that's why I write mystery. Okay. Because there is a black moment that I have to somehow get to. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge to me. I can see that. That's a fun way to write. Yeah. You're writing to the moment. and Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah that's a good way. I, I often do sometimes that with my, uh, the climactic event or the, you know, the low point right before the climactic event. I'll write to that. I know what it is. The story will be kind of based, or not just solely around that, but I know it's out there and I know I've got to get there. That's me. You know, I think All right. Larry yeah. Nevin, I think, is the type of author that maybe this is the last one, maybe it isn't, the, uh, for the types of science fiction, but he saw 
you know, the issues of the 70s when he was writing and imagine them to their logic, well, not a logical conclusion, not the logical conclusion. So, for instance, uh, if you had, during the 70s, overpopulation was the big bugaboo. So he was thinking that um, it wasn't even that overpopulated. Well, not yet. Not it was yet. in the future. But the <laughs> they idea, had no idea. The <laughs> idea is that at some point the world government was uh, there would be a world government was going to have to institute what we would consider draconian population control methods. So he imagined a world that so had these methods. Yeah. Well, yeah. Only the, in one of his books they were actually hunting down and killing pregnant women. <laughs> But point wow. is, it wasn't oh. necessarily even... Women can only carry, <laughs> like, a few kids at a time at most. Well, no, but that's the idea. That's they didn't not have, fair. They didn't have a permit to have a kid. If they could have whole litters, though, then it would be okay. <laughs> well, clearly. <laughs> I'm, I'm in favor of girls eight, not dying. I'm more for the Darwinian <laughs> method. You know, if you're too stupid to figure it out, then you don't deserve to. <laughs> but, See, so you're more in favor of, like, death traps seen everywhere. If minutes of idiocracy, that's not the way it works. <laughs> oh, so, um, unfortunately, the, the the less brilliant people are going to Yeah, reproducing is uh, one of those carnal, happened. basic things that people do even without instruction. Well, yeah, so. I mean, like, you know, there's cells all over the planet that don't even have brains and they can reproduce. <laughs> and all I'm going to say to this is it's already happening. Hey, as um, a certain mime I've seen, I know uh, Jamie saw as well, science fiction is for those, I'm sorry, reality shows are for those who can't handle science fiction. <laughs> reality shows, enough said. And apparently we've now moved into conspiracy theory right now. <laughs> we have about kind of gone potion. off topic here. About the mice potion, you actually did, Fedora, hit the last one. Yes, <laughs> well, the um, four, um, milieu or location. Um, which was yours, yeah. idea, character, and event. You just said event, so yay, all four. Mm-hmm. Do we turn into Captain Planet now? <laughs> oh, no, God. we need heart and a consolation monkey first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might be the only Captain. one at the table who uses uh, who uses art. I know I'm not the only one, because I know several of us have... Uh, <laughs> Several of us have resource files full of pictures to help them build their world and illustrate their characters. But as an illustrator in my all-the-time job, um, I tend to draw pictures of characters and scenes I'm getting ready to work on to get me in the mood or to muse on when I'm not working. So, like, for example, when I would go to a coffee shop or whatever, you know, I leave whatever I was doing and I sit down, I set everything up, I usually draw a picture on a napkin first. The picture of my character in the scene that I'm getting ready to draw. And that'll get me into the world. So, I guess, can art be a muse? Yes. I yes. think yes. so. Definitely. I'd do, that, definitely. I'd do that if I could draw. But I, mean, I draw <laughs> epic stick figures. <laughs> like, you know, I, I think that's why I write. is Because I get these very visual, almost movie-like images mm-hmm. in my head. And okay. I can't draw. Yes. So, they have to come out some way. Every know? book I'm writing is a movie in my head. Yep. Not to mention, I know Dave's like this, uh, mm. I have thousands of image files that I switch out as backgrounds or will use as, you know, uh, slideshows or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Literally for inspiration. Yep. Yeah, I kind of, I like listening to like, uh, I have like this whole selection of like ambient kind of music where it doesn't have like lyrics or anything. It's just very long and like kind of mm. noisy. And I use like those for whatever particular mood I want, you know? And I used to yeah. do that. That can help. Now I write or I listen to music that's faster, anything above like 130 beats or so, so that my fingers start moving faster. <laughs> I find mm-hmm. I type way, way faster listening to house music or something like that. <laughs> something crazy and just out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been kind of crazy. Because I, I used to be just like you, I have a whole stack of like CDs from movies that are, we probably all know well their scores. Mm-hmm. But yes. Actually, and like you, I what I do is with my music, I listen to movie themes, or not movie themes, but movie soundtracks. But I even listen to soundtracks that are up for movies never made yet. Um, just throw out a couple of bands real fast, or groups real quick. Two Steps from Hell, Immediate Music, um, Midnight Syndicate. Explosions in the Sky. Ex- there we go. Um, and what they do is, a lot of these people, a lot of these groups will have their music show up on theme trailers, if you will. But they come out with CDs that are made for music for movies never made. Midnight Syndicate. I'm going to write a horror. I've got my Midnight Syndicate on because that's all horror-related music. So I think it's interesting that you all... It seems like you write stuff without lyrics. Mm-hmm. So I, I tend to, too, because I know if I was listening to stuff with lyrics that I would start writing those lyrics as opposed to writing my book. Mm-hmm. And it's I find it distracting. So either I'd be writing those lyrics or I'd be listening to that and not writing. But I think... 
music with lyrics does also inspire me. You know, I'll be driving in the car and hear a song on the radio and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that's this scene in my book. It's describing that, which is why I think a lot of authors post playlists, you know, what they what songs they listen to or what inspired them when they were writing, which I think is really fun to see, you know, what an author used as kind of as their muse almost when they were writing. And then you can go back and kind of see if you can figure out what scene or what part of the book fits with what piece of music that they pick. See, I listen to audiobooks that I've already listened to before. Hmm. So I, it's the voices in the background. The soothing sound of a human voice. I guess so. so. <laughs> these are all the white noises that everyone yeah. uses, it sounds like, when they're writing so that they can tune things out that they're not trying to focus on, like, not the story. You know, and I sometimes. think that's kind of it. The, if the audiobook is there, if I lose my train of thought, I listen to the audiobook instead of my mind going off into a third story, mm -hmm. you know, that I'm making up in my head. What is more perfect, white noise, than white noise? I mean, just the noise of the house creaking and uh. ca traffic on the street outside. I can't abide to have music on because I get into it, I start dancing around and totally forget what I'm writing. My brain was built for distractibility. Yeah, I yeah. need something that I'm like, oh... I'm focused on this thing, so I don't have to pay attention to anything else. I Thank also you. can't write in front of uh, windows. I can never write in front of a window. I stare out the window too much. <laughs> See, I can't write at home at all. There, there's no chance. And that's why you're at Caldi's all the time. That's why, that's <laughs> why I go to coffee place. shop. Yeah, Actually, I write multiple best, coffee shops. I write best <laughs> okay. in coffee shops and in airports. I actually yes. write best at home. And on airplanes and trains. Yes. I actually write best at home, but I think it's because I live alone, and I can, yeah. other than my dog, I can control <laughs> the noise factor. <laughs> this is why I like writing best after midnight. Yeah, when I write at home, when I attempt to write at home, since I take care of an elderly parent, half my brain is listening for them to mm. say God knows what. <laughs> And so my mind is really distracted in a bad way. Jamie, you had mentioned um, ideas in the car and lyrics and everything. Um, and Jen, you had mentioned being inspired by art. Um, and I think that brings me back to the whole uh, inspiration versus the muse as something external. Um, it seems like people's muses are changing, but I'm not sure if those are necessarily the muse because Jamie, yours is named. So, like, how does the inspiration work with the muse and do you like I've heard some people have different ones I think it comes hand in hand I mean I think you know you get the inspiration and then it just I don't know it kind of morphs into and becomes this one giant glob of junk that just kind of like I said it's like a hostile takeover it just mm -hmm. it becomes this giant glob that is rooted in your brain and it just keeps expanding and oh now we're gonna do this and now we're gonna do this and oh you're gonna Sounds write like this a and, alien movie <laughs> You know, I think I need to uh, show the muse I don't care about it sometimes. So the reason why I started the cookbook is because the fantasy novel wasn't going well. The reason why I started the fantasy novel is because I needed to take a break from the sci-fi novel. But the point is, when I started on the cooking book, then all of a sudden I was back to writing the fantasy novel. Do you think part of that is because maybe your, your mind was too much in one direction and you needed yeah. to play more? I think I need to give myself time to th work things out in the back of my head. Now, this is a the fantasy novel. I'm a plotter. I'm a serious plotter. Oh, yeah. I know what happens a hundred <laughs> years in the future in my stories in general. That never stays true for me. Yeah, the trouble is, I was this fantasy book is supposed to be my attempt at seat of the pants, which, by the way, is failing. But it's <laughs> more seat of the pants than anything I've ever done. But because of that, I think I am plotting in my head. <laughs> So I think I need a break every so often so I can figure out what's supposed to be happening. And on a sidebar with that, then I think Jamie wants to say something real quick. One thing, um, okay, she takes her head no. Um, <laughs> the one thing, off of the muse for a second, I'm going to sidebar to this for just a second. Oh my goodness. A lot, I know, amazing how that happens. Anyway. <laughs> Weren't we on the side, how many sidebars are we on? <laughs> I can get enough sidebars side, to, fill side up, to fill up the entire ocean, but it's anyway. It's the muse's fault. They keep inspiring us exactly. to go off to the yeah. side. Exactly. For those of you listening, you could turn this into a drinking bar. A drinking bar. Yeah. Drinking game. Every drinking game, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just a bar. bar. Drinking <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just a drinking bar. But... I don't. I can. I know. I can speak for a lot of us. We get approached by brand new writers, and they say, "I've written a book, and I want to get it done." Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've gone through at least ten to twelve practice novels, kind of like what Melanie was hinting at. There is, hey, this is one I'm going to write for, as a pantser. I've written about a good dozen practice ones before I even attempt to go out with a real one. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to be a jerk, 
but I, I wrote, I had one novel that I really, I, I think I was just playing with characters and symbolism and all kind, you know, every possible thing that you could imagine when you were, when you're writing and then, you know, I never finished it and then I kind of went out and started, you know, and then I wrote a book and I finished it and started working on that. But I think I haven't played as much as you have, but in that respect, I think every time I sit down to write a book, the process is completely different. Yeah. The first novel I finished, very much to the outline. The second one I outlined, but it was like, you know, what was supposed to happen in chapter 5 ended up in happening in chapter 12, and what was supposed to happen in chapter 10 got moved forward to chapter 3, and it just, it didn't want to bend to my will, so... And that's why now I do the storyboarding ideas, because I will go through the storyboard, and then I will look back and go, okay, wait a minute, this is not how it's working, and move things around, it's easy to tear, tear apart and put back together. Well, going back to what Kathleen was saying, uh, in terms of inspiration versus the muse, okay, I can pull inspiration from anywhere, from a song, from art, from... A bird flying across the sky, you never know. But the muse is what, when I sit down and I want to take all those ideas and I want to put them on the page, well, she's the one right there who's helping me do that. And so inspiration isn't coming when I sit in front of the page. The words might, or something like that. That's inspiring. But everything that inspired what I'm about to sit down and do, that could come from anywhere. But my muse is the one who's, you know, actually getting the fingers going. The funnel through which everything exactly. goes. Exactly. And going back to the music statement earlier, sometimes I'm listening to the music not to get inspiration or for white noise, but sometimes it's like tossing tossing on a aerobics tape saying to my muse, get your butt in the ear. <laughs> well, I think that's why, at least when I sit down to write, I, I sit down and I look at what I wrote the time before, and I think that puts me back in the scene and brings the muse back to the forefront. and helps everything just gel and flow as I go into. So, tying up with muse then, what really do we even know what a muse is, or what are muses out of all this? Because obviously no one no one well, writer has the same thing muse. I don't know what it is. Is it something out there in the greater universe? Is it is the greater universe? Is it stars singing, you know, and their wavelengths that I just happen to pick up and call a muse? It's the voices I, in your head, that, but you're not crazy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're the voice in my head, but, you know. Yeah, I don't believe that it's a, you know, it's a Grecian god that's shanghaiing my brain and making me do things. No. I believe it's a part of me that's growing up out of what's inside me and what has built me in all these years I've been alive. Yeah, like, so those things. Yeah, I mean, those, all those experiences and just the stuff that I like seeing in other movies and, and books and, and songs, those things are what make me want to write because I want to put all the good feelings I get from the world around me and the media I consume all into one place so I can enjoy it and so other people can enjoy it. So the muse is a part of me, you know. I guess that's what I'm thinking. So we yeah, we is talk it about it. Yeah. Talk about it the being words that for you that you then call a muse. Well, it's almost even like deeper than that. Subconscious mm -hmm. uh, if you're, you know, it's like it's in your soul. It's part of the the Play-Doh that makes you up. It, yeah, I mean, it's in your soul, it's in your head, it's in your emotions, it's in <laughs> so many different pieces of you. Well, um it is pieces of you, but I'm curious about um, how much we externalize going back to the, Greek, the Greeks and the Romans and how they saw the muse as something outside of themselves through which, well, the muse was outside of themselves and would use them as a conduit to tell whatever story it was. Well, Does I, it help to externalize for you guys? or? Yeah, I, uh, I kind of like looking at it that way just because uh, it makes this, the stories and ideas that come to you feel a little more sacred. I think uh, how we approach it, how we tend to approach it as like writing people is analytically. And uh, we tend to look at the mechanics and all that, but that's not how people read it. How people read it is holistically. And uh, I think it helps to kind of keep that perspective of the idea of the story as like a sacred whole, as some kind of soul to it. So you don't r mess, mess with it too much with the analysis, with the reason. See, I don't like the idea of considering writing sacred because you're not supposed to, you know, tear up and rewrite sacred what works here. <laughs> Oh yeah, but I mean, just to I keep the I'm heart still of it. That, you're you trying know, to get the sacred idea to be more accurate day, to what it should be, though. Getting a new stone and starting again. Mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Fedora bring us to an end. Then I'm going to make one statement. That I think takes what you guys are saying and apply it. Well, I would just like to say that writing is an act of supreme arrogance. It we have the idea mm -hmm. that we can write something that other people would not only want to read but would somehow benefit from or enjoy. 
that is an act of supreme arrogance. And oh, for yeah. me, I think the muse gives me permission to be arrogant. <laughs> I like that. I like that idea. It gives you permission to have a voice. Going back with what Matt was kind of indicating, and we've all said this, you know, you've got the mechanics of writing, and you've got the muse. I can sit down, as all of us, all of us can, and take a bunch of students and say, this is how you put together a story. We can teach the mechanics of the storytelling, but it's that organic aspect of the muse that's within inside of us that actually breathes the life of the story into it. And with that, I'm going to close our first our first episode of The Write Pack. No Yay. Come back yeah. next week as we continue more talks on writing. Theme songs for Write Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Write Pack Radio would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their office. STL Books is a online bookstore specializing in new and used high quality literature, children's books, and books written by or about St. Louis. Please visit them online at www.stlbooks.com or find their store on the Amazon.com website.